Today we're diving into one of the most complex and tragic conflicts in modern history, the unending war in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Now, I know what you're thinking, Africa, conflict, this is going to be depressing, and you're not wrong. But this isn't just another sad story from a faraway land. This is about understanding how a country roughly the size of Western Europe, brimming with natural resources, has been ravaged by violence for decades. This is about the human cost of greed, the legacy of colonialism, and the international community's often well-intentioned but ultimately ineffective attempts to intervene. We're going to unpack this mess layer by bloody layer, and hopefully by the end you'll understand why this conflict matters not just for the people of the DRC, but for all of us. So buckle up, because we're about to journey into the heart of darkness, and trust me, it's going to get messy. To understand the DRC's current state, we need to rewind a bit. Back to when it wasn't even the DRC. Before it was the Democratic Republic of Congo, it was the Belgian Congo, a passion project of King Leopold II. Leopold ran the Congo like his personal piggy bank, extracting rubber, ivory, and more. His reign involved brutal exploitation, forced labor, and atrocities. Amputations for missed rubber quotas. Villages held hostage. Leopold's venture led to millions of deaths. When Leopold relinquished control in 1908, Belgium continued exploiting the Congo. By 1960, Belgium left behind a fractured society and a power vacuum. The DRC isn't just some homogenous blob on a map, it's incredibly diverse with over 200 ethnic groups. Belgium exacerbated this internal friction. They played favorites, creating a power hierarchy. This led to resentment and more violence. Remember the Rwandan genocide? Refugees, including inter Ahamwe militia, fled to the DRC. They brought hate and violence, destabilizing the region. You know that smartphone you're probably watching this on? It likely contains minerals mined in the DRC. Coltan, cobalt, gold, diamonds, the works. The DRC is bursting with valuable resources. But instead of prosperity, these resources bring conflict and exploitation. Armed groups and corporations fight for control, using forced labor. Profits from these minerals fund violence, fueling a vicious cycle. Next time you upgrade your phone, think of the DRC's suffering. Imagine a country where corruption is so ingrained it's practically a national pastime. That's the DRC in a nutshell. Decades of colonial exploitation, followed by dictatorships and civil wars, have left the country with a government that's about as stable as a Jenga tower. After a few beers, politicians, warlords and opportunists of all stripes are more interested in lining their own pockets than serving their people. Embezzlement, bribery and shady deals are the order of the day while basic services like healthcare, education, and infrastructure crumble faster than a cookie in a toddler's hand. This rampant corruption creates a breeding ground for instability and violence. When people have no faith in their government, when they see their leaders enriching themselves while the country burns, they're more likely to turn to armed groups or other forms of illicit activity just to survive. It's a classic chicken and egg scenario does the violence lead to corruption or does the corruption fuel the violence? The answer, like most things in the DRC, is probably both. Now, the DRC isn't some isolated island of misery. It's smack dab in the middle of a region that makes Game of Thrones look like a tea party. You've got Rwanda, still grappling with the aftermath of the genocide and accused of meddling in Congolese affairs. You've got Uganda, with its own history of supporting rebel groups and vying for control of mineral-rich areas. And then you've got Burundi, Zimbabwe, Angola, the list goes on, each with their own agendas, their own internal conflicts, and their own willingness to use the DRC as a pawn in their regional power plays. It's like a really messed up family reunion, 
where everyone's brought their baggage, and that baggage happens to be heavily armed. This regional involvement adds another layer of complexity to an already convoluted conflict. It's not just about the DRC anymore, it's about regional rivalries, historical grievances, and the never-ending quest for power and resources. It's easy to get lost in the geopolitical weeds here, to focus on the mineral wealth and the political machinations. But at its core, this conflict is about people, millions of people whose lives have been shattered by violence, displacement, and unimaginable suffering. We're talking about families torn apart by conflict, children forced to become soldiers, women subjected to horrific sexual violence. The DRC has become synonymous with human suffering, a place where basic human rights are routinely violated and where the international community seems powerless to intervene. The statistics are staggering. Millions displaced from their homes, living in squalid refugee camps, struggling to survive. Hospitals and schools are overflowing, while access to clean water and sanitation remains a luxury for many. The psychological toll of this unending conflict is immeasurable, leaving an entire generation scarred by trauma and loss. So, with all this suffering going on, you'd think the international community would be tripping over themselves to help, right? Well, it's a bit more complicated than that. The United Nations has had a peacekeeping force in the DRC for decades, the largest and most expensive in the world, in fact, but their presence has been met with mixed results, to put it mildly. They've been accused of corruption, ineffectiveness, and even complicity in some of the atrocities committed. And let's not forget the role of Western powers, who have often prioritized their own strategic interests over the well-being of the Congolese people. From propping up dictators to turning a blind eye to human rights abuses, the West has a lot to answer for in this story. It's a classic case of too little, too late, and often with strings attached. Here's a fun fact. The DRC is one of the poorest countries in the world. And this isn't some unfortunate coincidence. The conflict itself has created a perfect storm of economic instability, preventing any meaningful development. When you have armed groups roaming around, looting and pillaging, it's hard to attract foreign investment or build a functioning economy. The constant fighting disrupts agriculture, forces businesses to close, and sends skilled workers fleeing for safer shores. This creates a vicious cycle of poverty and conflict, where economic desperation drives people to join armed groups, further fueling the violence. It's a classic catch-22, the DRC needs peace to develop, but it needs development to achieve peace. And so the cycle continues, trapping millions in a quagmire of poverty and despair. Here's the truly depressing part. The conflict in the DRC isn't some static event frozen in time. It's a living, breathing monster, constantly evolving, mutating, finding new ways to wreak havoc. The lines between victims and perpetrators are blurred as former child soldiers grow up to lead their own militias, perpetuating the cycle of violence. Revenge becomes a way of life as communities torn apart by conflict seek retribution for past grievances. The social fabric of the country has been shredded, leaving behind a deep-seated mistrust and a culture of impunity. It's a bleak picture, I know, but it's the reality for millions of Congolese. And until the root causes of this conflict are addressed, until the international community steps up and takes meaningful action, the cycle of violence will continue, claiming more innocent lives with each passing day. So there you have it. The DRC conflict in all its messy, complicated glory. It's a story of greed, exploitation and the failure of the international community to protect the most vulnerable. But it's also a story of resilience, of the human spirit's ability to endure even in the face of unimaginable suffering. Understanding the root causes of the conflict in the DRC is crucial for finding a path to peace. It's a complex issue that requires a multifaceted approach, but with global awareness and concerted effort, change is possible. 
We need to demand accountability from those who profit from the conflict, support local peace-building initiatives, and pressure our own governments to prioritize human rights over strategic interests. The DRC may be a world away, but its struggles are our struggles. Because ultimately, this isn't just about the Congo. It's about who we are as a global community and the values we choose to uphold.